My purpose here, so I've been told, is to change your life. <laughs> I have 18 minutes. <laughs> and I think this must be a little bit like what Houdini felt when he was on stage and he would have his hands shackled, and have his legs shackled, and prepared to be lowered upside down into a vat of water where everyone could watch and see whether he actually was able to break himself free in the, in the allotted time or if he would drown. So I'm going to attempt to break out of my shackles, to do something meaningful, to do it in 18 minutes. And pay attention because I'm only going to do this trick once. <laughs> the other day, I was reading to my seven-year-old and we couldn't find the cat in the hat. So I persuaded him that, um, that the wasteland was pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and I don't know if it's a credit to the way Elliot or, or Dr. Seuss that he really didn't have an issue with that. It did pretty much seem like the same thing to him. He was a little disappointed that there were no illustrations. Other than that, it went quite well. And he, I told him that I actually teach this poem to, to a, a room full of 400 people, which is pretty much the size of his school. And he was, uh, he was astonished, and he said, well, why would people do that? And I said, well, you know, it's hard to say, but it's, 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 a, it's a breadth requirement. And that... <laughs> you see, I'm still humble. Um, and he looked at me with, with complete understanding, and he nodded his head, and he said, That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean, he said, you mean if they don't read this poem, they can't breathe. <laughs> and I said, and I said exactly. <laughs> I said, this is a breath requirement. <laughs> People who don't come to my class, and they don't read this poem, they suffocate. And, you know, the number one cause in our time of feeling constantly out of breath is our unexamined relationship to time. Great poetry, because it refuses to make use of time, is something we need to read for precisely that reason. Oscar Wilde said, all art is useless. And thank goodness, we so badly need things that are useless, because so much is useful. So much pressure on utilitarianism. Nothing has value unless you can figure out what it's going to do. One of our big new words is monetize. How can you turn this into something that other people will pay for? Auden says, at one point, W.H. Auden says, poetry makes nothing happen. And again, we underestimate what a remarkable feat that is. And how important it is to have something that makes nothing happen happen because if you can't make nothing happen you don't know what is happening when something happens it's not easy to make nothing happen Samuel Beckett did it twice in waiting for Godot which is a record the only play where nothing happens twice and we need to value that because it's only when we, some, when nothing happens that we begin to understand how it is all those other times that what we think happens, happened. We assume the question, what time is it, has universal meaning. But in our contemporary world, what time it is for you depends on what for you time is. And so the next time somebody says to you, what time is it, say, well, that depends. <laughs> what is your relationship to time? I can't guarantee they'll stop and continue to talk to you, but if they do, they're probably a soulmate. <laughs> our relationship to time has a great deal to do with the mythologies of our time. Now, you might say, well, haven't we gotten beyond mythologies? I mean, this is TED, and it's technology, and it's buzzy, and it's the latest. I mean, we don't do mythologies anymore, do we? I mean, we know the sun rises and sets, or at least we know why it looks like it does. And so we don't need a story about some guy dragging it across the sky in a cart. I mean, we're, 
We're past that now. Uh, well, maybe we're past that story, but the biggest mythology of modern time is that it's a time without mythologies. Because without mythologies, there's no such thing as time. Mythologies are what organize time in such a way that we're able to make sense of our reality. No mythology, no time. The problem is, by definition, mythologies are the unexamined principles that permit you to have the platform from which you make meaning. So we don't look at them, so we don't think we have them. We don't think we have stories that underwrite what we claim is real, but we have. And it turns out we, turns out we have, according to me, five mythologies. Progress, efficiency, perfection, satisfaction, and here's a tricky one with this crowd, innovation, I'll get to that, P-E-P-S-I, I call them the Pepsi myths, and I'm hoping Pepsi will sue me because I could use the publicity. <laughs> it's It's not like they're going to get any money out of me. <laughs> and, here's, and here's what they have in common. We're not there yet. Progress. We're not as organized as we could be yet. Efficiency. We're not all that we could be yet. Perfection. We're not satisfied yet. Satisfaction. We're not worried about the world yet. They're going to invent something any day now, a new innovation, and it will take care of everything. What all five myths have in common, and these, remind, these are organizing our relationship to time, is, is the gigantic not yet. It's a sort of imitation of immortality. That everything is yet to be, about to become. And this is not the relationship to time. It is a relationship to time, and it is our relationship to time. We know history is about time, but do we know the history of time? Do we know the history of attitudes toward time? Let's flash back to the Renaissance or make a point here. Hamlet meets the ghost of his dead father who's been assassinated by his uncle who is now currently on the throne having married his mother. This is what we call a bad day. <laughs> it would take everything Dr. Denby just said and more to get through this day. And so what does Hamlet say? Well, he says a lot. Right? We know that. It's like five acts long. But he says something that I find particularly pertinent to what I'm doing here today. He says, the time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Now, what's remarkable, that is just not a comment that would be commonly said or even understood now. The notion that time is set, that it has a joint that, that needs to stay located and that if something like your uncle killing your father and marrying your mother happens, that dislocates time. And then, but what's remarkable is that, is that Hamlet can say without any real questioning of this is, okay, it's, I was born to set it right. You know, like time's a dislocated shoulder and he has to snap it back. The Renaissance could See that, that was one of their relationships to time, that it was a period of hierarchical complementarity, that everything had a relationship to everything else, which in turn answered to some overall truth, which might be obscure to us, but was nonetheless present and palpable. And so when tragedy happened, it was dislocation, and the remedy was to locate again, to snap it back into place, some kind of existential chiropractor. The presumption of a harmonized time we can snap back should it become dislocated by events, no longer adheres. And yet we still assume that we have similar views on what we mean when we say wasting time, spending time, using time, my favorite, killing time. We have to kill time? Seriously, what did it do to us? We're so afraid to wait where we're a waiting phobic culture. Have you ever been in a waiting room? It's a psychotic experience because <laughs> waiting rooms are so full of things that saying, we got your back. You're not going to know you're waiting because we have a giant screen TV. We got an aquarium piranhas. We got free lollipops. We got, the clowns will be here any minute. 
For God's sake, don't have a moment where you think. <laughs> but maybe all that fails, and maybe there is that awful moment, and you're just about to go under, and then, thank God, your little phone goes, bink, and you say, oh, I got a text. Who is it from? Godot? <laughs> and, you know, no, it turns out it's from Susie, and she just bought a donut. And, and, and you know, you... And you don't even care. It's got oracular properties anyway because it saved you from, from sinking into the abyss of waiting. And why is that? Because waiting is an awareness of being brought on by an absence of doing. And being is not doing. You have to be to do. But doing is not being. I'm almost dooby-dooby-doo. Be. <laughs> and so the second... And so Hamlet feels this enormous responsibility. But in, by 1910, here's Eliot's J. Alfred Prufrock. What does he think about time? I measure out my life with coffee spoons. That's, that's how badly it's <laughs> degenerated. And he even says, no, I am not Prince Hamlet. And boy, he's got that right. Nor was I meant to be. I mean, Hamlet, there's no Hamlet anymore. There's no, you know, we don't even have that epic relationship to time. Now time is this dreary thing we punctuate by having our hundredth cup of coffee. So there's a deep irony that in this time, our time, a time where we never seem to have enough time to get everything done we need more than ever, we don't make time to think about time, to understand ourselves better. And the reason we don't, wait for it, is we don't have time. <laughs> if you don't make time, to think about time, you don't have time. It has you. We must, William Blake tells us, search for that moment in every day that Satan's watch fiends cannot find. Or as I like to call it, your iPhone. <laughs> Tirelessly, wirelessly sussing out every unharvested moment of your time, then threshing it with an app to be processed and resold back to you as something you lack that will save you time. What are the roots that clutch, Eliot asked. What grows in this stony rubble? So little takes root in this relentless current of our modern conception of time, which views time spent thinking about time as a waste of time. We don't read poetry to understand it. This is something I have to point out to my students. <laughs> and they think, you know, oh, good, because I'm ah, clueless. But... But, I, but seriously, we don't read poetry to understand it. We read it to understand ourselves. If you read a great poem and you understand it, you haven't read it carefully enough. <laughs> Our modern relationship to time is about accruing wealth in order to accumulate possessions. And the drive to do so has become so overwhelming that we seem not to have noticed that spending the time of our life to grow wealthy uses up the time of our life to grow wise. When King Lear, a wealthy man, foolishly divides his kingdom between the two daughters who connivingly flatter him and banishes the one who loves him too much to manipulate him for mere material, his fool says to him, thou shouldst have been wise before thou wast old. So two things we need to do before we grow old. Pay your mortgage <laughs> and grow wise. But how? Acquire knowledge? Knowledge speaks, but wisdom is knowing when to listen. Acquire money. Money talks, but all it ever says is goodbye. Acquire things that others envy. To be is to be seen, but wisdom is knowing who we are when nobody is looking. And it can come as no surprise that in our culture where time is just a great not yet, forever about to deliver what it only ever promises, TED Talks themselves play a role. TED Talks are forward-looking. This is where we're headed. This is what we're beginning to understand, starting to develop. Sky's the limit, etc. As I look at my clock counting down. <laughs> TED, with its ubiquitous presence on YouTube, needs to be careful, or it could become yet another internet fetish, which we'll have to call techno-porn. <laughs> the intellectual equivalent of a quickie. We have to
I actually cleaned up that line. Of course, <laughs> like TED Talks, poems too gesture to possibilities of new beginnings, but they do so by asking us to remember our ending. They are a sort of linguistic memento mori. Death is the mother of beauty, Wallace Stevens said, the line least likely to ever show up on a t-shirt. <laughs> but by which he meant that it's only by the fact that things are fleeting that we appreciate their beauty. It's because something is dying while it's thriving. It's the, thing, it's the fact that something thriving is also dying that drives beauty through the green stem of our world. But enough of this, I'm running out of time. I'm going to tell you a fairy tale. Once upon a time, no, seriously, I'm going to tell you a fairy tale. <laughs> there were these three sons, and there was a king, and he said, it's time for you all to get married. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot an arrow in three different directions. They did things differently back then. <laughs> and, when, and whatever picks it up, that's, uh, that, that's who you have to marry. So he shoots the first arrow. A princess picks it up. That son trots off. He shoots the second arrow. princess picks it up, trots off. Shoots the third arrow. goes in a swamp. Out of the swamp, arrow in its mouth, comes a frog. And the king says, you know the rules. <laughs> you have to marry the frog. So the guy marries the frog, and he's the laughing stock of the whole kingdom. And something happens. He, takes, he brings the frog home. And once the frog is inside, it unzips its frog skin. And out steps a gorgeous, beautiful princess. She's loving. She's compassionate. She was, she's wise. She, as we like to say now, gets him. He's thrilled. But the problem is, whenever she goes back out, she has to put her frog skin back on. And so everyone keeps laughing on him because he's walking around with his wife on a pillow. <laughs> and so he gets sad. And he says, would you just please once go out without the damn frog skin on? And she said, all right, fine, I'll do it. I'll do that when we go to the annual ball. There's always a ball in these stories. <laughs> so he goes to the ball. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. Everybody's sick with envy. He is so happy. He says, I've never been this happy. This is happiness. And he goes home, and he burns her frog skin. Yeah, you know this is bad. And this is not Disney, by the way, so brace yourself. <laughs> she comes home. She sees what he's done. And if this were Disney, obviously she'd have a spare, and some mice would pop up to sing about it. And, <laughs> and while the pigeons wash the dishes. No. This is not Disney. She can't live without the frog skin. She lies down. She holds his hand, the love of her life, and then she dies. That's all I got. That's it. But <laughs> nobody lived happily ever after. Okay, why did I just tell you this? This is Ted. We're supposed to be looking forward. <laughs> Not looking at the dead love of our life. <laughs> what is my little parable here? Here's the parable. Don't burn your frog skin. <laughs> and I'll give you my little manifesto here relative to the Pepsi myths. If you fail to appreciate where you are now because you're not making progress to a place ever promised yet never seen, you burn your frog skin. If you sacrifice the integrity of what you love in pursuit of efficiency, you burn your frog skin. If you dislike who you are because you're not yet what you've been told you could be, you burn your frog skin. And if you're dissatisfied with what you have because of everything you don't, you burn your frog skin. If you turn away from what you believe to be wrong because you imagine the next innovation will cover up your careless mistakes, enrich your neglected relationships, heal a wounded earth, and deliver to everyone equally and in a sustainable way whatever they want with no effort or sacrifice required, then you burn your frog skin. In our current time regime of a perpetual not yet and not enough, what is most precious about you will appear as expendable, as a hindrance, as something holding you back, something preventing others from perceiving your true worth. You will be tempted to get rid of it. You may come to a billboard. The billboard will say, just do it. Don't. <laughs> Continue down the road to my billboard. It says, just don't do it. <laughs> it's not that hard. I can do this, too. Just don't do it. You will need your frog skin because you are not on a journey to elsewhere. 
The purpose of your journey, as T.S. Eliot tells us, is always to return from where we began and know it for the first time. That's why there's no myth of progress. You're always trying to come back to understand where you've been, much like that interesting stone sculpture of the bird with the golden ball leaning backwards. I like that. The great poet W.B. Yeats, Nobel Prize winning poet. And by the way, I don't seem to have much clue of how much time I have left. Am I slightly over here? Okay, well, I'm just going to be a rebel. <laughs> I'm just going to let the techno police come down on their ropes. <laughs> and Yates was trying to write a poem. He was already won the Nobel Prize. Everyone thought he was the best poet in the world, and he couldn't write this poem. And he realized the reason he couldn't write this poem is that the poem didn't care that he was W.B. Yeats. It didn't care that he'd won the Nobel Prize. And he thought, how do I write this poem? And then he realized that he was going to, every time you write a poem, you have to go back to who you are. That's all the poem cares about. And so he wrote a poem about that. And he called it the circus animal's desertion because all of his circus animals refused to perform that day. They wouldn't give him his poem. And he ended it this way. He said, I must lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. And that's where I'd like to leave you. Thank you. <laughs>